This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is episode 105, Brooklyn and Lorenzo Velasquez, part one. When first responders arrived at the Velasquez family home in Superior, Arizona, on the evening of March 26, 2018, they encountered an unfathomable tragedy. Two young children had been locked into a car for over 13 hours in the Arizona heat, and by the time help arrived, two-year-old Lorenzo Velasquez and his nine-month-old sister, Brooklyn, lay dead on the floor of their great-grandparents' home. Immediately, police doubted the story they were given by the children's mother, 20-year-old Brittany Velasquez, who was quickly arrested and charged with first-degree murder. This is the story of a pair of young, innocent siblings who were fundamentally failed by both their mentally impaired mother and the state's child protection system. It's also the story of a loving, multi-generational family who did everything they could to prevent the tragedy that ultimately befell them. This is part one of the heartbreaking story of Brooklyn and Lorenzo Velasquez. Before I begin, I'd like to give a shout-out to my newest patrons, Katya H. from Newport, Tennessee, Sarah C. from Lamar, Colorado, and from elsewhere, Gail B. and Michelle S. Thank you all so much for your support. Every pledge brings me closer to my goal of permanently devoting myself full-time to the podcast, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate your help. You'll have to excuse my voice. I might get a little raspy or hoarse throughout the episode. Every time I get a cold, which I've been suffering with for the past week, I tend to lose my voice after 18 years of telephone customer service work. The story I'm about to tell you will undoubtedly be one of the saddest you'll ever hear. When a tragedy like this one occurs, most of us feel the ingrained urge to blame someone. I'll admit that I was quick to lay blame myself when I first covered Lorenzo and Brooklyn's story on the blog back in late 2019, but I've since removed that blog post. After a great deal of research and a lengthy and enlightening conversation with the children's maternal uncle, Vincent Velasquez, which you'll hear in the next episode, I feel very strongly that my original account of what happened to these two beautiful babies needs to be told from a much fairer, more thoughtful perspective, which is the story you're about to hear. The Velasquez family has lived in the same home on South Richard Avenue in Superior, Arizona, for decades. Sally and Lorenzo Velasquez raised several children there, including Sally's daughter, Christina, from a previous relationship, as well as their three biological children together, Lorenzo David, or Choppy, Patricia Lynn, or Patty, and Victor. Sally and Lorenzo, who went by the nicknames Lencho and Larry, outlived all four of their biological children. Their son, Choppy, died in 1994, daughters Patty in 2003 and Christina in 2005 and Victor, who lived in California, passed away in 2020. Patty Velasquez gave birth to five children, Christopher, Gabriel, Vincent, Amber, and finally, Brittany, who was born in December of 1997. According to family members, Patty likely used drugs throughout her entire pregnancy with Brittany, who was born extremely premature. As a result, Brittany's brain did not develop properly, and as she grew older, she began to display cognitive and behavioral problems. Patty's adult life was tumultuous, and she had several run-ins with the law, including charges of theft, shoplifting, trespassing, burglary, and drug offenses. By 2000, all five of Patty's kids were in the care of her parents, Larry and Sally, who filed for child support from Patty and two of her former partners. Ultimately, the loving grandparents officially adopted all five of Patty's children and raised them in their home. 
Gabriel was autistic, functioning at about the level of a four- or five-year-old. Due to his special needs, he requires lifelong care, so his grandparents, who were already in their 60s by the time they adopted the kids, had their hands full. As Sally and Larry grew older, their health issues also began to compound. Larry was plagued with chronic illness, and Sally's arthritis eventually became debilitating. Add to that their granddaughter Brittany's escalating mental and behavioral issues, which became all but uncontrollable as she grew into a teenager, and it's hard to imagine how difficult daily life was for the family. I'll get into more details about Brittany's issues a little later in this episode. By 2015, Brittany Ann Velasquez was in an off-and-on relationship with a man named Christopher Matthew Miranda. Even as a young teenager, for a while, Brittany lived with Chris's parents, to the chagrin of her own grandparents, who struggled to deal with Brittany's out-of-control behavior. In August of 2015, when Chris was 25 and Brittany was just 17, the young couple married. In Arizona, the age of legal consent is 18, but a person aged 16 or 17 can marry with the consent of at least one legal parent or guardian. Brittany was, at the time of their marriage, already pregnant with her first child, whose biological father was actually a local man named Charles Cayouette. Despite that fact, Brittany's first child, born on December 4, 2015, at Banner Baywood Hospital in Mesa, Arizona, was named Christopher Matthew Miranda Jr. Even though Chris was not the little boy's biological father, it is apparent that both Chris and Brittany considered him the father of both of Brittany's children. As is usually the case, the couple's relationship appeared more idyllic than it really was. Brittany's Facebook page makes mention of what a good father and husband Chris was. On October 10, 2016, she posted a photo of her husband along with the caption, Man crush every day is this wonderful, handsome man I'm proud to call my husband and father of our kids. I love you, baby. Brittany did make a reference on Facebook, however, to some ups and downs in their marriage. And in March of 2017, when she was about six months pregnant with her second child, Brittany filed a petition to have her son's name changed from Christopher Matthew Miranda Jr. to Lorenzo Michael Velasquez due to domestic charges that his dad has against me. I don't want my son's name to be a name that follows violence. It is in the best interest of my son. In a document filed with the court a month after the initial application, Brittany's husband, Chris, signed his consent to the name change, although the couple was separated by that time. I've been unable to find any additional information about the domestic charges referenced in Brittany's petition. From here forward, for consistency's sake, I'll refer to her son as Lorenzo, although it's worth noting that almost no one called the little guy either Christopher or Lorenzo. Some called him Baby Chris or Baby Christopher, but almost everyone referred to him by the nickname of Aki. His sister, Brooklyn Rose Velasquez, was born on June 4, 2017, in the same hospital as her brother, Banner Baywood, in Mesa. Not quite two weeks after his daughter was born, at the age of just 26, Christopher Matthew Miranda, who was born on August 27, 1990, died in Mesa, Arizona on June 16, 2017, from what his family members have said was a drug overdose. Chris left behind his children, including Lorenzo, Brooklyn, and a daughter from a previous relationship, his mom and stepfather, Kathy and Wes Wernett, his father, Joseph Diaz, his brother, Jordan Romero, and his sister, Chiara Romero. Despite their impending divorce and the fact that they'd been separated for months, two days after Chris's death, Brittany posted on Facebook, Happy Father's Day, babe. You were an amazing daddy to Aki and Brooklyn. I miss you so damn much. R.I.P., my love. You will always be in mine and the kid's heart. I will always have you by our side. I love you, baby. The next day, she posted a photo of Chris and herself kissing, along with the caption, I'd do anything to have you back, baby. Brooklyn, Aki, and I will always keep you close to our heart. We love and miss you so much. Chris's mom, Kathy, said that when Chris died, Brittany showed no sadness or remorse. Brittany did, however, set up a GoFundMe page, lamenting that Christopher's death was devastating to us all. Still, as it does, life went on. Four months later, on October 27, 2017, Brittany posted a professional photo of herself cradling her small, well-dressed children in her arms, along with the caption, I may not be perfect, but when I look at my children, I know that I got something in my life perfectly right. Under the surface, though, things were most certainly not perfectly right in Brittany's household. 
For months, family members, local authorities, and others had been contacting Child Protective Services, expressing concerns about the safety of Brittany's children. In late March of 2018, 20-year-old Brittany moved herself and her children out of their apartment in Mesa and back in with her grandparents, who were by that time in their 80s, in their home on Richard Avenue in Superior. Larry and Sally were exhausted after caring for the children for most of the week while Brittany moved, and on top of that, Larry had been sick all weekend with pneumonia. On Monday, March 26, 2018, the first day of her new job at a local restaurant, Brittany was scheduled to work a 12-hour shift. That morning, she asked her grandparents if they could watch the kids for the day, but Sally asked Brittany to take them to the babysitter so Sally and Larry could recuperate from their difficult week. Not long afterward, Sally saw her granddaughter buckling Lorenzo and Brooklyn into Brittany's car. When Brittany returned home from work just before 11 p.m., she went inside the house expecting to find her children inside. Why she expected them to be there if she thought they were with a babysitter is unclear. When her grandmother told her the kids must still be at the babysitter's, Brittany immediately bolted outside, where she found Lorenzo and Brooklyn lifeless in her grandparents' car with blood coming from their mouths. Brittany carried the bodies of her children inside the house, where her grandfather, Larry, tried to perform CPR to no avail while Brittany called 911. By the time first responders arrived at the grandparents' residence on Richard Avenue, the kids had clearly been dead for hours. Both two-year-old Lorenzo Michael Velasquez and not-quite-ten-month-old Brooklyn Rose Velasquez were pronounced dead at the scene. Brittany later told Pinal County Sheriff's investigators that she dropped her two kids off with a babysitter at 9.30 a.m. If she took the kids to the babysitter, police asked, how did they end up in her grandparents' car? Brittany explained to deputies that for some unknown reason, the babysitter must have brought the kids to the house and buckled them into their car seats inside their great-grandparents' vehicle. Once they interviewed the supposed babysitter, sheriff's deputies strongly doubted Brittany's story. The babysitter, whose name was redacted from the report because she was underage, told officers that no arrangements had been made for Brittany to leave the kids with her, and the babysitter's parents backed up her story when speaking with investigators. The sheriff's report read, There was no proof that Brittany actually dropped the children off. It was apparent that Brittany was attempting to place the blame onto somebody else for this incident. It is known that the kids spent several hours in the vehicle, as there was condensation on the inside windows of the vehicle, and the children were cold to the touch, and rigor mortis had already set in. The Superior Police called in the Pinal County Sheriff's Office to take over the investigation, and the Sheriff's Office quickly arrested Brittany and booked her into the Pinal County Jail on two charges of first-degree murder. During a joint news conference on Tuesday, March 27th, the public heard pieces of the story from Pinal County Sheriff Mark Lamb, Pinal County Public Information Officer Navita Forgani, and Interim Chief Christian Ensley of the Superior Police Department. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. Um, obviously, this is a very tragic a call for services is one that we as in law enforcement hate responding to. Um, it's a tragedy for a small town like Superior. This is uh, a place where a lot of people know each other and uh, the word travels fast. So please keep uh, the family in your prayers as, as we uh, talk about this case. Um, we are currently investigating this case. The mother has been booked in uh, to the Pinal County Jail on two counts of first degree murder. We are currently still investigating. We're awaiting the autopsy and the toxicology reports for the two kids. So those charges could change. We're going to work with the county attorney's office to make sure that we get the appropriate charging. Um, However, at this time, she is at the Pinal County Jail on two counts of first-degree murder. Um, We received a call at about 11.15 last night, the Pinal County Sheriff's Office, requesting our assistance. We have since taken over this investigation. Uh, We have the manpower to do so. So uh, with the Chief's blessing, we've taken over this investigation. I'll have him talk about what was found on scene. We showed up after the scene had already been, uh, where after Superior PD had already shown up on scene. Uh, The call was for two uh, children found deceased in a car. Um, So we responded with our detectives and our crime scene investigators. 
And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, people will keep them in their prayers, too. This is not something that's easy for us as investigators or deputies or law enforcement to show up to. So we have our own work to to deal with our employees to make sure that the impact of a, of a scene in a case like this uh, does not go unnoticed as well. So well, please keep those guys in your prayers, too, the family and the officers, detectives and crime scene investigators that had to respond and process this case. Motives, we don't have a motive on that. Um, as far as what she was doing and her whereabouts and who was caring for her, we're not going to answer those questions at this time. And um, I can say that, yeah, the kids were found strapped in a car seat in the back of the vehicle. I'm Christian Ensley, and I am the interim chief of police for the Superior Police Department. Uh, last night at approximately 2256 hours, we responded to a medical call in the, in, uh, the 100 block of Richard Avenue. And the initial details were that two infant children, excuse me, one toddler, one infant have been found deceased inside of a vehicle. CPR efforts were performed. They were not successful. This is a small community. We know Brittany. Um, in the last two years, we probably responded to her home, to her house, on seven or eight different occasions for various matters. We're still reviewing our records, but we know at least one incident that happened on January 3rd where CPS was contacted in reference to children. It is my understanding that when the January 3rd incident was reported, they did not take any action. This is a small community. It is absolutely rocked, superior. The last homicide investigation of any significant magnitude was probably eight or nine years ago. Occasionally people die in car accidents in the area, but this is unheard of for us. It is, it is a massive blow. I mean, those children have relatives in this room. I'd seen them before. I know who they are. It's a devastating blow. After the story came out, the community had plenty of questions. Some wondered if the children's deaths could be a tragic mistake, another case of the basal ganglia, otherwise known as the lizard brain, taking over and a hapless parent accidentally leaving her kids in the car, which is a real and unimaginably horrifying phenomenon that happens, according to advocacy group kidsandcars.org, to an average of 39 children every year in the United States. To break those numbers down further, in the U.S. in 2017, 45 children died in hot cars. In 2018, there were 54, 53 in 2019, 26 in 2020, and in 2021, there were 23. Since 1990, over 1,000 children have died in hot cars nationwide. Time for one of Lane's infamous tangents. I need to talk about this because the subject of hot car deaths has been one of my pet topics for many years. I know a lot of people think there's no way an attentive, loving parent could ever accidentally leave or forget their child in the car, believing instead that horrible parents get away with murder using this excuse. However, there has been a good amount of research done into the phenomenon, and based on the scientific and anecdotal evidence, I wholeheartedly believe it's possible for this to happen to anyone. There was a Pulitzer Prize-winning article in the Washington Post in 2009 by Jean Weingarten titled Fatal Distraction, Forgetting a Child in the Backseat of a Car is a Horrifying Mistake. Is it a Crime? If you've never read the article, I can't recommend it highly enough. Since the day I read it, I've never forgotten it. I'll include links in the show notes for this episode to the article as well as to kidsandcars.org, which is an absolutely essential resource for all parents and caregivers. This passage from the Washington Post article is particularly powerful. What kind of person forgets a baby? The wealthy do it, it turns out, and the poor and the middle class. Parents of all ages and ethnicities do it. Mothers are just as likely to do it as fathers. It happens to the chronically absent-minded and to the fanatically organized, to the college-educated and to the marginally literate. It has happened to a dentist, a postal clerk, a social worker, a police officer, an accountant, a soldier, a paralegal, an electrician, a Protestant clergyman, a rabbinical student, a nurse, a construction worker, an assistant principal. It happened to a mental health care counselor, a college professor, and a pizza chef. It happened to a pediatrician. It happened to a rocket scientist. I'm in no way saying a parent couldn't stage a tragedy like this in an attempt to get away with the murder of their young child. 
I am saying, though, that it's important we're aware of the risks posed to children around vehicles, and that includes hot car deaths, no matter how convinced you are that this could never, ever happen to you. Our brains are highly fallible. If you're capable of forgetting to pick up milk on the way home from work, or missing your usual turn or highway exit, or even arriving home without specifically remembering how you got there, you're capable of forgetting a child in the car, no matter how good your intentions or how excellent a caregiver you are. A lot of circumstances have to converge into the perfect storm for it to happen, but it happens with terrifying frequency. Now, in this case, I am definitely not saying Lorenzo and Brooklyn's deaths were caused by a lapse of memory on Brittany's part, and they were without a doubt preventable, especially considering Brittany's history of visits from the police and investigations by CPS, now known in Arizona as the Department of Child Safety, or DCS. Brittany was officially investigated twice by the Child Protection Agency for alleged neglect, and Superior Police made multiple visits to her home over the previous few years. Many of these visits were spurred by calls to authorities by relatives concerned about Brittany's lackadaisical attitude toward parenting. All the way back when Lorenzo was an infant, family members had concerns about Brittany providing proper care. Two of her older siblings, Vincent and Amber Velasquez, later told 12 News, She had baby Christopher, and he wasn't being fed. People have even seen her apartment. It was just flooded with diapers, like you couldn't walk. The kids were constantly sick. Vincent said of their attempts to involve DCS, probably everyone in the whole family has called. I was like, can I just take them because something bad is going to happen? And they're like, well, that's kidnapping and, you know, you'll get in trouble. The first report to DCS of alleged neglect came in October of 2016 when the department was told Brittany had a habit of leaving Lorenzo home with her grandmother for extended periods of time. Regarding this report, according to a DCS statement, the child was seen on multiple occasions during the investigation. The DCS investigator concluded there were no indications the child was being abused or neglected, and there were no legal grounds to remove the child. The case was closed as unsubstantiated. On January 1, 2018, a relative called police, alleging that Brittany had stolen a fur coat worth $3,500 from her. During this call, the relative also let it slip that Brittany hadn't kicked the habit of disappearing for days at a time, leaving her children to be cared for by family members. A few days later, on January 5th, DCS received the second neglect report, which alleged Brittany had abandoned her kids with her grandmother again. During the investigation, DCS did not seem concerned whether or not Brittany had permission to dump her kids off with Sally and Larry because they ruled Brittany would not be investigated for child neglect or abuse unless her grandparents stated they were no longer willing to care for the children. This DCS case was also closed as unsubstantiated, but only after DCS visited Brittany's Mesa apartment and signed the kids up for no-cost daycare through the state. There's no indication as to why Brittany didn't avail herself of the free childcare at her fingertips instead of leaving her kids in her grandparents' car. Just weeks before the children died, Vincent made his last call to DCS. I just remember saying she's going to do something stupid and these kids are going to end up dead. In a statement, DCS made reference to Brittany's mental state, saying, While there were concerns raised regarding Ms. Velasquez's previous mental health, no evidence was presented by anyone that indicated mental health issues were impeding Ms. Velasquez's ability to parent. However, after Lorenzo and Brooklyn died, Brittany's relatives took to the media with their side of the story. Vincent told Fox 10 that Brittany suffered from mental illness since she was young, but that she refused to get help. He told the news station, We tried. We begged CPS to take the kids. We begged the cops. Nothing would happen. Only thing we can do. We can't kidnap the kids. My grandparents let them stay in the house. Other than that, that's all we can do. No, they are in a home being fed. Because Brittany, she was kind of a little deranged. She's very manipulative, so we would call, explain her mentally, she's explaining what she's doing, they would come and talk to her, and they would just leave. We would never hear anything back. They would come, talk to her, and leave, come talk to her, and leave. But, like I said, she would, she would manipulate them to look normal. Describing Brittany as lacking basic empathy for other people, Vincent told Pinnell Central, We all expected this. We all knew she had major issues. He said Brittany was able to manipulate the police and CPS, which is why their investigations went nowhere. Three days after the deaths of his nephew and niece, Vincent published a lengthy and comprehensive Facebook post about the situation. The post read as follows. 
I am Brittany's brother, and I'm going to clear up some confusion. Let's start with her mental health. She was born extremely premature, and her mother was guaranteed on drugs the whole pregnancy. Her brain wasn't properly developed. Since a young age, she had a lot of mental problems, but she was so young we thought maybe she would grow out of it. When she got a little older and then was able to hurt herself, we started reaching out to mental health facilities. They would start trying to help and diagnose her, but she would always run away and hitchhike home. They even suggested a lockdown facility in the middle of nowhere that could force her to stay to receive the therapy and help she needed. She still escaped and ended up home. I think the number is 17 facilities we took her to and asked for help, but she truly thought she was normal. Go to any mental facility and all people there think they are the normal ones. So she refused everything and would run away. We all decided for her safety to just stay home, and when she became an adult, hopefully she would be mature enough to accept help. They were starting to know she had multiple personalities, bipolar, schizophrenia, and I think a couple other things. When you would talk to her, socially she sounded very intelligent. But once you start to be around her, you see the other things that make you normal were not there at all. I have never seen her legitimately cry out of sadness. She was very good at fake crying. She had literally no emotions. I have never seen any sign of love or compassion come from her. She didn't have the ability to put action and consequences together. She would do things that had a very obvious outcome, but she couldn't see what the outcome would be. It was very frustrating seeing her do things, and we would try to explain to her the consequences, but she refused to acknowledge it and believe whatever she thought was the truth. There are many examples and reasons we say this, but I don't want to write a novel on here. Next, let me clear up what we tried to do to help the children. Referring back to her lack of love and compassion, she would not pay attention to her kids at all and would very irresponsibly leave them anywhere with absolutely no thought of who she left them with. She couldn't reason like a normal parent would. She didn't see the kids in a risky place, just that she would show up and they would always be okay. She would drop them off somewhere and not show up for days to pick up the kids. We would beg her to change her kids' diapers, bathe them, hold them, and just try to tell her to show them more love. We let her stay with my grandparents so we would know the kids had a safe home and we would always know where they were. She would be gone from my grandparents' house for days at a time and nobody would know where she is. We tried calling CPS, and the cops would come and track her down. CPS would come and say they seen no bruises and the house was habitable, then leave. They didn't care about the accusations of mental illness because she hasn't been diagnosed. We all called CPS and told them she is going to leave the kids somewhere dangerous without thinking clearly, and is going to hurt the kids, but they didn't care. The only ones on our side who tried to help was the Superior Police Department. They knew how she was, and they even called CPS, and when CPS wouldn't do anything, the police would help us by tracking down the kids and doing wellness checks. We all wanted to take custody of the kids, but we couldn't get the help to do so. Now, to clear up what happened the day they died. My grandma said she couldn't watch the kids that day and to take them to the babysitter. Brittany told us about the babysitter she had, and we trusted that girl, so we thought it was okay to let them go there. So my grandma wakes up and Brittany says she has the kids in her car and is going to drop them off at the babysitter before her 12-hour shift. She put the kids in my grandparents' car, then went to work for 12 hours and came back and immediately checked the car and found them dead. She took them out of their car seats and my frantic grandpa tried saving them, but they were far gone. My grandparents are old and go days without even getting in their car or even really going outside. My grandma is wheelchair-bound and my grandpa has severe pneumonia. They couldn't hear the babies crying because the windows were rolled up in a very new vehicle that is sealed very tight. Standing next to it, you would barely be able to hear them cry. There are no next-door neighbors, just houses across the street, which wouldn't be able to hear them crying. Now to the motives. The babysitter couldn't watch them that day, so she left them in the car. Now the hard part is getting into a mentally ill person's mind to find out why she did it. We think she assumed my grandpa would eventually go outside and find them in the car and be forced to watch them that day and expecting to come home and just get scolded, but everything would be fine still. Or she put them in there to die, not probable. Now, here's some interesting facts about the whole situation. Brittany has repeatedly said she would drop them off with that approved babysitter, but it is proven the babysitter has never watched them. The couple times she asked the sitter, she was unable to due to other things going on. Understandable. The weird thing is she would always say either my sister is watching the kids or that certain sitter, but they both denied watching them on those days. So where were the kids on those days? Let's look into some possibilities. She has a history of leaving them in the car. 
One time she went to Walmart with some friends, and she tried leaving them in the car, but they refused to let her and would proceed to call us and let us know. Why was she so confident with leaving them in the car? When Brittany would do something that works once, she does it until it doesn't work without any thought of what could happen. We could try to call and report that, but since we didn't see the kids in the car, nobody could do anything about it anyway. There were times she would stay the night at a guy's house and give multiple stories on where the kids were. At the time, we all believed the stories, but after talking to investigators, we all figured the kids weren't ever where she said, so we assumed she would leave them in the car overnight. All these things we are figuring out is too late. If she simply said the sitter couldn't watch them Monday, my grandparents would have. Kathy Wernett also told Pinal Central that Brittany should not have been caring for her own children, suggesting the system failed Lorenzo and Brooklyn. She described her son's marriage to Brittany as a volatile situation and said she had wanted it annulled. Kathy said that Brittany was a compulsive liar. Her grasp on reality isn't there. Brittany did a phone interview with Fox 10 not long after her initial arrest, doubling down on her initial lie. I haven't really been showing too much emotion to everything that's going on because I don't know how to feel. Like, I'm just very hurt. My, my, my pride and joy was taken from me, and it just makes me really mad. It makes me very mad. I feel betrayed. Like, I really feel betrayed. I, mean, I just want her to just say, like, the truth, like, that she had them. The truth is eventually going to come out. It is. For what it's worth, Heavy.com spoke with a woman named Emily Stanford, who claimed she attended rehab with Brittany from 2013 to 2014, when Brittany was in her mid-teens. Emily said she believed the reason for Brittany's rehab stay was heroin use. I'm devastated for those poor children, but I'm not surprised. She was always a nutcase in my opinion. DCS's statement seemed to address the concerns of the family and the public alike. We understand these types of tragic events evoke emotional reactions. We, too, feel pain when children suffer. However, we can only make decisions based on the available evidence and what the law allows. The department acted in good faith based on the information we received and exercised our due diligence during these prior investigations. Brittany's sister, Amber, spoke with azfamily.com describing her nephew and niece as smiling and always happy. I don't think anyone would imagine this happening to their family. They were so innocent. I would call baby Chris my papas, and Brooklyn, I would call her my little fairy. So I just kept thinking, not my papas, not my little fairy. Brittany had just taken the little ones to the mall the week before. A photo with the two of them perched on the Easter Bunny's lap was the last one taken of the children. Amber said, I lost my niece and nephew but I'm also losing a sister. We would talk every day, all day. I know what she did was the most horrible thing, but at the same time, that was my sister. Even so, Amber believed her sister needed to face consequences. Anyone who would commit that crime, I would want them to be arrested and face their punishments for what they did. Amber created a GoFundMe page to assist the family with funeral and other expenses relating to the children's death which, tragically, included vehicle repairs due to the fact that the children's bodies sat in their great-grandparents' car for several hours. On the GoFundMe page, Amber referred to Lorenzo as Baby Christopher. The campaign, created the day after the children died, raised over $11,000 and has since been ended by Amber. The heartrending description reads, Baby Brooklyn and Baby Christopher tragically passed away on Monday, March 26, 2018, due to negligence by their mother. Our family is now stricken with extreme grief, and we would really love any support. Anything will be greatly appreciated. Everything is going to be very financially tough. Baby Brooklyn was going to be 10 months old April 4th. She was full of life and always smiling and playing. Baby Christopher was two years and three months. He had an incredibly bubbly personality and loved to play and dance. These two special souls will be greatly missed. No child should ever go through what they went through. We would love to provide them with at least a proper burial. May they rest in peace. They are now beautiful angels. These Easter pics were taken March 23rd. Their last pic together. Now they lay to rest together. I will be withdrawing all donations to give to my grandparents, Larry and Sally Velasquez, who will then use it to help pay for expenses resulting from the deaths, such as cleanup, vehicle repairs due to nature of death, celebration of life costs, church costs, etc. 
at the Children's Joint Funeral on April 7, 2018, at the St. Francis of Assisi Catholic Church in Superior, their Uncle Vincent delivered the eulogy, during which he said, They spent their last moments together, and now they shall rest in peace together for eternity. The funeral was attended by dozens of police, firefighters, and other first responders who were deeply affected by Brooklyn and Lorenzo's deaths. After the funeral, Lorenzo and Brooklyn, with a police escort, were taken to the Fairview Cemetery in Superior, where they were buried next to their maternal grandmother, Patty, in the Velasquez family plot. The children were laid to rest side by side in the same small, white casket, holding hands. Autopsies on Lorenzo and Brooklyn determined the children died of exposure. The high temperature in the area on March 26, 2018 was 71 degrees, but due to the greenhouse effect responsible for so many hot car deaths, the temperature inside the car may have been astronomically higher. According to heatkills.org, at 70 degrees on a sunny day, after a half hour, the temperature inside a car is 104 degrees. After an hour, it can reach 113 degrees. The report from the Pinal County Medical Examiner's Office, signed by Dr. John Hu, said the children's deaths were consistent with exposure to the elements. It also mentioned that sheriff's officials had reported Brittany left one or both of her children in a parked car for a prolonged period of time, at least twice before the fatal incident. I think it's important to understand exactly what happens to a small child enclosed in a hot car. Excess heat causes a small child's body temperature to rise several times faster than in adults because their little bodies aren't yet as efficient at fielding excess heat. As the child's temperature rises, they become agitated and may try to remove clothing to cool off. However, if they're strapped into a car seat, this kind of movement is impossible, leading to further agitation. The child becomes dizzy, nauseous, sweaty, thirsty, and confused. As neurological dysfunction kicks in, the body stops sweating and the skin becomes hot and red. Dehydration causes electrolyte imbalances and toxic levels of sodium begin accumulating in the child's body. Cardiac arrhythmia and other irregularities begin, and the child's body is no longer able to regulate blood pressure. The child's skin becomes discolored, and there may be skin slippage, meaning blisters form beneath the skin as the tissue beneath begins to go through autolysis, otherwise known as self-digestion. Keep in mind, everything I've just described happens while the child is still alive. The child begins having seizures and hallucinations, experiencing delirium and a rapid heart rate, and if they're lucky, may slip into a coma. When enough cell damage has occurred, the child's organ systems will shut down in rapid succession. Hemorrhages take place in the lungs and other organs, the brain swells, and cerebral edema forms, meaning fluid accumulates around the brain. The child eventually dies as the body temperature climbs over 108 degrees Fahrenheit or 42.2 degrees Celsius, and the organs experience autolysis and necrosis or tissue death. In some cases, these children are found with their fingernails torn and bloody from trying to claw their way out, with hair torn out by their own little hands, with scratches on their own faces. Many times they're found with their eyes open. In other words, this is one of the most painful, torturous, horrifying, slow ways anyone could die, and we all need to be aware of how quickly it can happen. After even 15 minutes in a hot car, a child can experience life-threatening brain or kidney damage. Again, please check out kidsandcars.org, which is a boundless resource of information. Because investigators initially believed Brittany must have intended to kill her children by leaving them in the car all day, she was initially charged with two counts of first-degree murder, although soon afterward, those were dropped in favor of two counts of second-degree murder instead. In November of 2019, a month before her trial was scheduled to begin, not-quite-22-year-old Brittany Velasquez accepted a plea deal, pleading guilty to second-degree murder and child abuse. In exchange, Pinal Deputy County Attorney Sean Jensvold told People, She agreed to a stipulated term of 20 years flat, followed by lifetime probation. She won't be eligible for early release. Brittany's family was instrumental in convincing her to take the plea agreement, which a lot of people thought let her off too easily. When you hear my conversation in next week's episode with Brittany's brother, Vincent, 
I think you'll come to agree that given the options and the circumstances, the plea deal was most likely the best case scenario and will keep Brittany locked away for the longest possible time. Brittany Ann Velasquez, Arizona Department of Corrections inmate number 343759, was booked into Arizona's Perryville Prison in its Santa Cruz unit on May 26, 2020. She is described as being 5 foot 3 inches tall, weighing 138 pounds, with brown hair and brown eyes, and her projected eligible release date is listed as March 22, 2038. Perryville Prison contains three units, including San Pedro, Santa Cruz, and Lumley, which houses Arizona's female death row inmates. Infamous convicted murderer Jody Arias is incarcerated in Perryville's Lumley unit, as are two women we unfortunately got to know quite well in a previous episode. Cynthia Stoltzman and Samantha Allen, also known as Samantha Uriarty, are both serving their sentences in Perryville Prison's Lumley Unit for the 2011 murder of 10-year-old Amy Lynn Deal, who died after five members of her supposed father's family abused and tortured her for years, finally stuffing the little girl into an airtight plastic footlocker and padlocking her inside overnight in the Arizona heat. Amy died on July 12, 2011, from asphyxiation compounded by heat exhaustion and dehydration, and five people were convicted in her murder, including the man she thought was her father, David Deal, his mother, Judith Deal, his sister, Cynthia Stoltzman, her daughter, Samantha Allen, and Samantha's husband, John Allen. Judith Deal was released on probation from Perryville's San Carlos unit in February of 2020 after completing her prison sentence. Samantha and her husband were both sentenced to death, which Samantha awaits alongside her mother in Perryville Prison. I told Amy's story way back in Episode 9 of the podcast, so if you do go back and listen to that one, please keep in mind that I was still brand new at this, and like I've said before, I really like to think I've improved as a podcaster and a person since then. One final note. The Velasquez family sadly lost its patriarch, Lorenzo Otan Velasquez, on April 16, 2021. According to his obituary, Larry, or Lencho, was born on February 27, 1938, the oldest of three children, and served four years in the United States Navy beginning when he was 18 years old. He was married to his wife, Sally, for 58 years. Lorenzo was a very hardworking, dedicated family man. Lorenzo worked all his life in many different trades. There isn't anything Lorenzo wouldn't do for his family or friends. Lorenzo was the most kind-hearted, giving man with nothing but good to offer. He will be sorely missed, but we wish him love, peace, and happiness with his children and great-grandchildren. Whenever I can, I like to end each episode by remembering the children as they were in life. During her phone interview with Fox 10 not long after her initial arrest, Brittany showed a hint of emotion while describing memories of her children. She said of Lorenzo, His favorite words were cheese, tata, bye, nana, mama. He had a smile worth a million words. About Brooklyn, she said, She was very, very happy. There's not a moment I'd never seen her smile. The kid's obituary says, These children were both happy, full of life, and very loving toward each other and all those whose lives they entered. Vincent told 12 News that his nephew, Lorenzo, who loved to dance, was rambunctious and a little bit of a troublemaker. One Christmas, Vincent said, I remember when all the presents were in my old room at my grandparents' house. I was taking a nap in there, and I hear just a weird noise, and I look up, and he's like scouring through all the presents. And then Brooklyn, she wasn't walking yet so she was always just kind of hanging out like someone was always holding her. That's pretty sad. She never even got to learn to walk. If the kids were alive today, Lorenzo would probably be in kindergarten. He would have turned six in December, and Brooklyn would be getting ready to turn four this summer. Sleep well, little angels. My sources for this episode were AZ Central, Heavy.com, Pinal Central, AZ Family, Fox 10 Phoenix, Facebook, GoFundMe, Bullman Family Funeral Homes, Legacy.com, ABC 15, The Washington Post, KidsAndCars.org, People, Big Think Edge, Find a Grave, Legacy.com, HeatKills.org, The St. Francis of Assisi Parish Facebook page, 12 News KPNX, The Arizona Department of Corrections website, 
the Arizona Judicial Branch Public Access Portal, and the Arizona Judicial Branch e-access document portal. That's it for this week. Next week, you'll hear my conversation with Brittany's older brother, Vincent Velasquez, who offered tremendous insight into the tragedy that has changed his family forever. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Spreaker, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com, where you can listen to episodes or become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to bonus content and exclusive gifts. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at Suffer the Little Children Pod, and on Twitter and TikTok at STLCPod. View photos related to today's episode on Facebook and Instagram. For more stories like the one you heard today, visit SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast is researched, written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. All music for the show is licensed from AudioJungle.net. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to sufferthelittlechildren.pod at gmail.com. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit childhelp.org or call your area's child abuse hotline. If you see something, say something. Until next week, bye everyone.